Firstly, in this session, they didn't give any great guidelines and uh, just said, do whatever I would like to do. So I will first explain what we are going to do, and then uh, we will. Uh, I just want to make some introductory comments, and then the speakers will take their place. So there are uh, five speakers in this session, in this order, before coffee break. Then there is coffee break, and then two more speakers, and there will be time for discussion. So it is. The concept of emergent gravity means different things to different people. At some very fundamental level, anybody who is doing any kind of quantum gravity can say that, uh, well, after all, we are doing emergent gravity because gravity is going to emerge at the classical level or semi-classical level out of some structure which is in the quantum mechanical thing. So every quantum theory model, quantum gravitational model like string theory or loop quantum gravity or CDT or whatever can claim, uh, uh, can claim to be doing something on emergent. But that is not what we are going to really concentrate on in this. There was an idea that gravity is somewhat like elasticity of space-time due to Sakharov long back. And many people have worked on it since then. The next in some sense historically going would be the membrane paradigm for black hole horizon. And uh, Kip has promised to give a historical account of how those things developed in his talk just after coffee break. One pioneering piece of work was from Ted Jacobson, who tried to interpret this in a particular way. And many of us, uh, me and my collaborators, and uh, Rong Chen Kai, and uh, his group, and many others, have followed up on that. And I'm sure he will be saying a few things about it, and I will also cover a little bit of that. There are also people who work on uh, analog gravity model. This is really not emergent gravity, but it is closely linked to. and uh, Coming out of that, there is this work by Grisha Wolovic and his collaborators, which tries to describe the entire thing as some kind of a condensed matter phenomena, gravity and even other interactions. Then all this has uh, some implications for dark energy, emergent cosmology, etc., which also I'm, I'm sure Rong Chen Kai will uh, touch upon. Okay. Then, of course, if you really think gravity is emergent, then there must be something for the pre-geometry. And as I said, if the pre-geometry is either string theory or loop quantum gravity or whatever, we already have specified sessions for that. Though Shiraz will be talking about connections between string theory and fluid mechanics in this context. And uh, we have Rafael Sorkin, who was probably the only person I know who predicted the value of the cosmological constant before it became even popular, let alone being detected, from a causal set approach. And uh, that is one interesting model for pre-geometry, if I may call that uh, that and there is going to be a talk by him. So as I said, this is the order in which the talks are going to be made. That is not of great particular relevance. I'm sure there will be a lot of overlap between the talks. So as I said, uh, no interruptions during the talk, sharp questions at the end of the talk, and uh, we will have plenty of time for a discussion in the last half an hour. So let me invite my first speaker, uh, Professor Rong Chen Kai. Uh, Goa, very interesting site and also wonderful conference. Today, what I what would like to discuss is the relation between the horizon thermodynamics and the gravitation field dynamics. Just as I introduced a few minutes ago, I will discuss the relation between the gravity and the thermodynamics. Uh, as you know, the dynamic of space time is described with the Einstein field equation. On the other hand, the first law of thermodynamics is another subject in physics. There are any relation between them? Actually, uh, uh, there are some hints there are which connect these two different subjects, which means as, uh, uh, the, as the title of the, this mini-section, actually, gravity, in this sense, gravity is not the fundamental force in nature, but uh, in some sense, like the effective, e effective theory. Here I will focus on three kind of the horizon to discuss the relation between the thermodynamics and the field equation. Uh, first is the linear horizon, second is the black horizon, and the third one is the horizon of FRW universe. So from the first part, I will show you how to get the Einstein equation from the first law. Basically, this part is just the repeat the open, uh, repeat the observation by uh, Jacobson. Then I will move to the black hole horizon. I will show you black Einstein equation on the black horizon can be recalled as the first law of thermodynamics. Then discuss the dynamical case, 
to show you how to get the Friedman equation from the first row and the set row. <coughs> then the uh, conclusion. Uh, to introduce the, get the, the Jacobson observation, I have to introduce the two in very important ingredients. One is the Rindler Horizon and it's under temperature. The Rindler Horizon actually is nothing, just some boundary of the region in which some of the uh, uniformly accelerating observer cannot see. Because, uh, as you know, in the Minkowski space, space, a uniform accelerating observer cannot see the whole space, but it is a limit. Uh, the boundary is not is, is nothing, but it just, uh, it's called the Linder Horizon. To be obviously, then consider the Minkowski space, in this is a cotton chart. We can do the Lorentz boost in this coordinate transformation, then the Linder chart in the linear chart, the Minkowski space turns out to be this one. In this framework, the observer uh, is uh, the, a universal uh, accelerating observer is uh, uh, rest. It means uh, if suppose living is a constant x, then there is a constant acceleration. For such kind of things, from this matrix, obviously the x equal to zero is the horizon. Actually, from this the coordinate transformation is clear. Right? The, the horizon is nothing but just the two non half set planes in the uh, original uh, Minkowski space. For such a kind of the uh, linear observer, as uh, there is a well known uh, phenomenon, it's called the annual temperature. For such kind of the observer, the, it, with the acceleration A, then there is a temperature. Temperature is given by A over some the coefficient two pi c k. H bar is the of some coefficient is the Planck scale and the Boltzmann uh, constant and the speed of light. A is the the acceleration. Then the this is a, just the, the linear patch. The observer can only see this region. This is the two line is nothing but the linear horizon. The key observation all by the, made by Jacobson is that consider even any event in covered space, then we can use, introduce a local initial frame around it with Lima normal coordinate. Then transfer this one to the local linear horizon by accelerating along with x with acceleration k. Then there is a temperature given by this one. You can calculate the heat across across, uh, across the horizon. Suppose in the space time, the, mat, the matter is described by the uh, any momentum, TAB. Then, chi A here is nothing but is approximate both the heat index on the horizon. Then, this one can be related with this way. KA is the target vector to the horizon, generate of for the final parameter, lambda, which is vanished at the even the P. DA is the area element on a cross section of the horizon. So you can get the heat uh, close the uh, upper, uh, the uh, linear horizon. On the other hand, the cause horizon should be associated with some entropy. This is suggested by the observation because such kind of horizon, they are hidden some information which you cannot actually cannot see by the uh, linear uh, observer. Now we assume that the entropy is proportional to the horizon area. So that the entropy variation associated with a piece of the horizon satisfied by this relation. Suppose here eta is a uh, proportion constant. Then the area variation related to the entropy variation in this way. Because of this area variation is, can be explained by the theta expansion. Consider the Richard Duhara equation. Suppose the, the theta and the sigma vanish at P, the two leading order then the theta can be get from this equation. And the, we get this is the variation of the area. Now consider the Cloche's relation, uh, which is related to the uh, heat uh, uh, flux and uh, the change of entropy times the tem uh, temperature. Then this one, this, this relation lead to this equation. Here TIB is the energy moment and RAB is the leach tensor. And F is the arbitrary function here. How to det det define uh, determine the function F? Then let's consider local conservation of the edge moment. Then you can uniquely determine the, the function F 
is nothing but the Galagovich plus the, some constant. Put it back to this equation, you will get this one. So from this way, you will see this is nothing but just the Cosmic constant. Then if you publish the eta in this way, with relation with the Newton constant, this is nothing but the Einstein equation. This is a very beautiful derivation of the Einstein equation from the first law thermodynamics. Okay. There are some of the few remarks for such kind. Of, for this is the such kind of way it worked for the Einstein general relativity. How about the general case for FR gravity and the scalar tensor gravity? A non-equivalent uh, dynamic setup has to be employed. Second point is that assume the non-vanish of the shear, even for Einstein gravity, a non-equivalent thermodynamic setup is needed. It means there is an entropy production term which should be put in here, so that so to produce the proper the equation motion for the gravity. Here, delta S i is proportional to the squared shear of the horizon. So from this way, you will get shear shear with cosity of the entropy density is 1 over 4 pi. This is a well-known result from recently. Uh, it's produced in ideal safety constants. For any diffeomorphism invariant theory, yes, given what entropy formula by the closure relation, it's possible to drive the gravi gravitation field equation. This is done, but uh, the party has a different uh, idea. The reason is that the, the world entropy is given through the gravity. It means once you are given the world entropy, for it means the gravity is no. We are interested in that to get the the uh, the gravity uh, the equation motion for the gravity from the arbitrary the entropy formula. This is uh, uh, what we, what we are interested. In. Now let's consider the even halos of the black holes. Let's let me first uh, <coughs> consider Einstein general relativity. This is uh, as you know this is the well known Einstein equation. Consider a generic static spherical symmetry space time. We parameterize the matrix with two functions, f and b, f and b, which these are two continuous functions of the r. Suppose there is a non genuine horizon r plus, then the temperature is given by this one. It's quite simple to get the temperature, target temperature. Now let's consider Einstein equation. Here is the uh, Einstein tensor, TT component and RR component. At the black horizon, over zero, f r vanishes. So these two equations are generated to this one, tend to be the same as this. The TT component of the Einstein equation at the horizon can be derived as this way. Here, P is the radial pressure of matter at the horizon. We get the very simple equation. Now we multiply displacements. It's a very small displacement of the horizon on both sides of this equation. Then you will, you will get this one. This equation can be recalled recall this one, this guy. Here, V is the uh, vol volume element for the black hole horizon. So if we uh, make the identification with the entropy is this one, energy is this one. Energy is given by R plus over the 2G. Then this is, uh, OK, of course, is well known the entropy, begins than Hawking entropy formula. Then this equation can elect to write on this way. Of course, this is nothing but just the first law of thermodynamics. <coughs> As for the black hole in the Hajawa Lipschitz theory, this story also goes on. Because uh, why we consider this one? Because the Hajawa Lipschitz is not the full uh, diffeomorphism invariant theory. Uh, to describe the theory, we is convinced to use the same formula. Is and the end the lap function and the shift shift vector and the GI is a special matrix. So for a space large type space with a fixed time, the extreme coverage can be lied on. The action is a little bit complex. We consider three terms, L not, L1, and M. L is five and a half. L this is a kinetic term, other terms are uh, potential terms. The constant. Constant has a relation with the speed of light, the Newton constant and the cosmic constant. Which you, are, you may not care about that, you just mind it. This is a constant. We consider black hole black solution in this way, the action can be reduced to this one. Here, R is this one, anyway, it's just a constant. Constant case, lambda equals to 1, then 
uh, go on to make calculation, then consider the horizon, you will get this one, the equation motion. Multi multiply dx plus a. x plus a is has relation with the horizon, this one here. Uh, both sides, you will find. And this equation, from this equation, consider the Hawking temperature is given. Then this equation lead you to this one. Once again, the volume V is the volume of the black hole. This is not just the first law of thermodynamics. Here, entropy is given by this one, and energy is given this one. So such kind of formula is the same as, as uh, those from the other way. We use the Hamiltonian analysis to get the entropy and the energy. To compare the two, two way, we get the same result. In the more general case, the story also goes on, it goes weak, no, no, no any problem. A uh, few there remarks or something. Such kind of sense holds for Lovelock gravity. This is, uh, is uh, has proven, proven by Professor Padmanahan, and uh, also this holds for stationary black hole, even the spherical symmetry horizon. And uh, it also holds this one, charged BTZ black hole is, is done by uh, Akaba. And, but uh, it is found a uh, non-equivalent uh, thermodynamic setting is needed for such kind of FR gravity, for example. Now let me move to the uh, third part for the dynamical space-time, like the FRW universe. Uh, in this part, I will show you three parts. First, I show you how to get the Friedman equation from the first law. Then I, wa then I, sh I show you why this kind of story holds, because the Friedman equation at the epihelion can be recast as the first law of thermodynamics. Then I show you there is a Hawking radiation at the epihelion. This is a FRW universe. Okay, K is the curvature of the spatial factor. A is the scale factor. Then this is a well known Friedman equation. H is a Hubble parent, and uh, here we consider n plus one dimension. Rho is energy density. Okay, p is a, p is the pressure. N is a dimension plus n of dimension. This is a well known direction. Our goal here is from the first law of thermodynamics to get the Friedman equation. This is the first law. Here minus is just the, the energy, just the, the convention of the definition. The, no problem. Somebody let to work this here, I show you. Now, I like this FRW universe in the two parts. It introduces the physical, uh, physical distance, R tilt. Then the A, B is the T, R sector, with the X not equal T, X1 is R, core moving, core mo coordinate. Then let's consider epihelion in FRW universe. By definition, you will find the radius of epihelion is given by this formula, 1 over square root h square, k over a square. Of course, in the FRW, you, you will have the other concept of horizon, like the particle horizon, hub horizon, or, and the even horizon sometimes. Why we should choose the epihelion? The reason will be clear shortly. Now, apply the first law to the epihelion. Then, because uh, to do that, we make two answers. One is, uh, first, we assume there is a temperature associated with epihelion. It's given by 1 over 2 pi Ra. Ra here is the radius of epihelion. And assume, wait a minute, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Into a 5, a 3, and two ones. A tensor, a scalar, uh, a vector, and two scalars. OK? This symmetry is very useful because it would take what would have been 10 coupled ordinary differential equations and reduce, you know, puts them, make, makes them one, one equation for the five, one equation for the three, and two coupled equations for the one. Usually, your uncoupled second order differential equations you can solve. Linear differential equations you can solve. In this case, it's just true. I'm going to explain how, you so, how, how the solving works for the simplest case and the most important case, namely that, that of the five. Okay, so let me see, be a little more specific. So, this G1 correction form of the metric, let's suppose I take, uh, I take it to be the following form. I take it to be multiplied by R squared like the overall metric was, and then an unknown function, alpha ij of r, and then dx i dx j. This is the part of the unknown metric that transforms in the five. This is symmetric and traceless in the, in the ij directions. Okay, uh, now when I plug into Einstein equations, Einstein's equations, I look at the ij component of Einstein's equations, what do I get? I get an equation that looks like this. I get an equation, that's my second order dif ordinary differential equation, d by dr, r squared f of r, d by dr, alpha ij, 
is equal to minus 6 r squared sigma. This is a trivial equation to solve. You solve it by integration. You integrate once, divide by 1 over r to the 5, they integrate again. That's your solution. Okay? Where the sigma is the shear tensor built out of the velocity field, u mu. This is not something I put in anywhere. This comes out of Einstein's equations. Okay? Fine. Now, let's look at the solution. The solution I've, here, uh, this should have been sigma, this is alpha. I've just omitted all indices. This is alpha ij, this is sigma ij. The solution, as I've said, is, well, you integrate, divide by 1 over x uh, r to the 5 f of r, and integrate again. That's the solution. But there's something very important about the solution. Usually, when you're solving a differential equation, you have two unknown integration constants. Well, you, you would in general here as well. Remember, we're solving these, these differential equations independently at every x. So these, differential, these constants could depend on x. So that would lead to a solution with a two-function worth ambiguity. Okay? Now, the really crucial point here, and this is really important, is that, you, that imposing reasonable physical requirements, you get a solution without this two-function ambiguity. Okay, see, uh, the two function, function ambiguity could be thought of as the beginning and the end integration points in these two integ integrals. Now look, what's really important is that, that f has a zero at x equal to one. So, unless this function here also had a zero, this integral also had a zero at x equal to one, we would get a singular solution. Rule one, we are going to look for Smooth, regular solutions to Einstein's equations. Solutions with some sort of funny singularity, not shielded by an event horizon, are thrown away. Okay? This forces us to set this lower limit to be 1. Okay? So that this, this integral has a 0 at x, at x, equals, uh, x equals 1, which cancels the zero. Okay? So you get a nice regular solution. What about, this? what about this upper limit? We choose it to be infinity because, rule 2, we're only interested in asymptotically ADS solutions of the equations. So concentrating on regular asymptotically ADS solutions of the equations of motion, the solution to our differential equation is unique. Okay? Given a u mu and t of x, there is a unique, and once you've defined those concepts properly, I've hidden something from you, but anyway, given that, there is a unique solution to these equations. Okay, great, fine. Okay, now you can play the same game in the scalar and the vector sector. You finish it, and this is what you get. Uh, then you, you know, we solved this in the special frame where u mu was 1, 0, 0, t was 1. Now you rotate back to, to the arbitrary value. Uh, and this is what you get for the, the metric to first order the derivative expansion. These terms were just what we started with. Hi, yes. These terms were just what we started with. The first line is what we started with, with u mu and t as functions of x. These are what came out of perturbation theory. The corrections at first order to make that configuration a solution to first order in epsilon in the derivative expansion. And note that the solution is unique given any u mu of x and t of x uh, that obey the constraint equations. Okay, great. Now, um, now suppose we wanted to go to second order. What would we do? Well, we'd play the same game. To start with, once again, we would try to solve the constraint equations of second order. But remember, the constraint equations are simply the conservation of a stress tensor. The stress tensor, though, is now the stress tensor that comes out of this first order matrix. And this has a correction. In the perfect fluid case, the stress tensor was just this guy. But because of the corrections that we got by solving the dynamical equations at first order, the stress tensor now gets, receives this correction. Okay? So in order to start the process of continuing this perturbation theory to second order, we first need to solve the constraint equations. Remember, we weren't allowed to start with any old temperature of x and u of, u of x. It had to obey certain equations. This equation gets corrected order by order in perturbation theory. And this equation here is the equation of motion of a perfect fluid corrected by viscosity term with a given value for the viscosity. The value came out of Einstein's equations. And that value obeys this famous relationship, eta by s is equal to 1 over 4 pi. OK? Great. So now to start the second order calculation, we need to solve this, this, new integra this new integrability condition. Once we've solved that, we go, go ahead and solve the dynamical equations. You can do that. It's, a, it's some work. But um, yeah, I'm going to flash the answer for you. Not, it's important. This is the metric where the unknown functions in this metric are defined here and here. Okay. 
some completely explicit solutions. Not very, what? Ah, you see, after put, getting the solution, I said epsilon equals to one. Epsilon was a formal parameter for me. Um, the real role of epsilon is, is e epsilon really counts derivatives in units of temperature. Okay, so every time there's an epsilon, there's a derivative by temperature. So that's a real perturbative parameter. Epsilon's an organization parameter for temperature. Okay, and then at second order, you calculate a stress tensor. The starting point of third order perturbation theory would be to conserve this stress tensor. So now this is a fluid stress tensor of the perfect fluid term, a viscosity term, and five new correction terms. And so on, you could go on forever. You could go to 37th order if you were interested in that. Okay, this, uh, okay, great. Now, fine, I've said all this. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm basically through. What, 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 have, what, have we, what, what have we seen in this talk? Okay. A simple application of the collective coordinate method allows us to promote the four parameters of black brain solutions in asymptotically ABS space to an infinite dimensional set of solutions of Einstein's equations. The new set of solutions of Einstein's equations are labeled by temperature as a function of x and velocity as a function of x, but these fields aren't completely free. In order for this per procedure to work, these fields have to satisfy a differential equation. And interestingly enough, this differential equation turns out to be the relativistic generalizations of the Navier-Stokes equations, namely the equations del mu t mu nu equals zero, which specified forms of t mu nu as a function of, uh, of t and mu. And Einstein's equations tells you exactly what the fluid expansion of the stress tensor is. So Einstein's equations are producing a fluid and a fluid with very particular coefficients. Okay. The map between Einstein's equations and the solutions of fluid dynamics is locally in solution space, one to one within the long wavelength sector. This I cannot emphasize enough. You know, we, we, it's not just that we are associating a solution of the Navier-Stokes equations with the solution of Einstein's equations in, in, uh, uh, in the presence of horizons. This map is locally in solution space in the long wavelength sector, invertible. This was the point that we got a unique solution to Einstein's equations specifying U and T. Okay. This is a full dynamical equivalency of two nonlinear systems. These two nonlinear systems, under assumptions, under this non wavelength assumption, one or two other assumptions, are equivalent. It's not like one is a sub part of the other. Okay. In this context, Einstein's equations reduce as a dynamical system to Navier Stokes equations. Okay. I emphasize that the equations of fluid dynamics are dual to the full space time. We needed to put specific boundary conditions at infinity in order to obtain these equations. I don't get these equations just by local considerations on the horizon. This is in contrast to what we'll probably hear from Kip Thorne later today, uh, and it would be very interesting to see the connections between these two, these, these two, these, these, these two statements. However, of course, the event horizon is clearly a very important uh, surface in what we're doing. It's what's responsible for dissipation, gives rise to a positive density entropy current, very important fluid dynamics. One concrete outcome of this procedure is an infinite number of dissipative coefficients at successive orders in the derivative expansion, like the viscosity, but generalized to higher orders. As I will describe on Saturday, uh, the ADS CFT correspondence relates these coefficients to otherwise impo almost impossible to compute numbers in a very important quantum field theory. Okay, the map I've described has many, many generalizations and uh, uh, many, I hope, important implications, uh, but some of them are not worked out and some of them I'll discuss on Saturday. Thank you. ADS space, the isometric group of ADS space, or the asymptotic isometric group of asymptotically ADS solutions, Einstein's equations, have a conformal symmetry. Okay, the, the isometric group is SO4, comma 2, which is the conformal group of a four-dimensional field theory. Now, there's only one equation of state that is consistent with conformal invariance, namely pressure is t to the 4. So gravity, of course, gives us pressure t equals t to the 4, but that, that's no surprise. That follows from symmetries. Okay? That follows from the fact that what we're actually doing in boundary theory language is dealing with the uh, fluid dynamics of conformal field theory. Okay, so just like photons, just like photons, pressure is t to the four. Photons, free photons are conformally invariant. Any conformal field theory has this property. So that's the reason we're getting this. We can't, within the setup, within dealing with asymptotically ADS spaces, I cannot get any other equation of state. It's true, it's always true, I'm sorry. It's, it's the source. Okay, but the thing that's difficult, that makes equations difficult to solve is the left hand side. And that left-hand side is the same at every order of perturbation theory. So you see, perturbation theory has this structure. This left-hand side on an unknown is equal to something known. Known meaning having done the earlier orders of perturbation theory. 
So it's the differential operator on the left hand side that has missed this root. And so this is true at all orders. Yeah, the sources get more complicated, but they're known. What I want to talk about is connected with uh, all these other various aspects, but I will try to focus on a few things. So the paradigm which I want to explore is that the classical gravity has the same conceptual status as, uh, maybe I should go there. Everyone has been on conceptual status as elasticity or hydrodynamics, okay. What is more, I mean this is as we said, every quantum gravity guy would say that the gravity is emergent, etc., etc. I am going to claim that there is sufficient internal evidence in the structure of classical gravity for this, that if you stare at it, you will be able to guess this. And a very wide class of gravitational theories, including but not limited to Einstein's theory, can be derived from uh, thermodynamic consideration. Okay, so this is going to be the idea. So the key point is that the classical gravity actually tells you that I am emergent, okay. And uh, the question is, how can this be? Now, in fact, there is an issue that uh, once you have the classical structure and you want to go down to the quantum structure from top down in the length scale, could such a top down view help at all? Can one look stare at a classical theory and look at its, uh, look at its underlying structure? Actually, you can. And in order to convince you that it is not such a preposterous thought, I want to give you two historical examples. The first example is that of Boltzmann and gas dynamics. Boltzmann's time, he knew that uh, there is thermodynamics and the gas exhibits thermal phenomena. And just based on that, he could show that unless something like this exists, the equipartition law, and there are microscopic degrees of freedom, you cannot explain thermodynamics. So just looking at thermodynamics, you could guess at the microscopic structure, that the microscopic structure of a particular kind should exist. If you stare at this equation, this E and T are thermodynamic variables, but this object on the left has uh, no relevance in thermodynamics in the sense that it is infinite uh, n limit in which we work in thermodynamics. And it counts the number of microscopic degrees of freedom which is contributing to that. The more classic example, which is often not looked at in this view, is Einstein's own idea with principle of equivalence. You can ask the question completely in the context of Newtonian gravity, why is inertial mass equal to the gravitational mass? But if you want to answer it, you want to go one deeper layer and you want to say that gravity is linked to space time. So there are examples in which you can have a top down view allowing you to guess something. But the main point is that you need a very strong guiding principle like the principle of equivalence for this to work out. And I would propose that the relationship between horizon thermodynamics and gravitational dynamics should act as a guiding principle in this particular context. So this is the idea which uh, me and my collaborators have been pursuing for nearly 10 years now. And it has yielded quite a few key insights. And because it is a sort of a 25 minute, 30 minute talk, let me first run over the insights and then I will take up a few of them for detailed discussion. The first thing it tells you is that you should think beyond black hole horizon, okay. Any null surfaces for a particular class of Rindler observers acts as a horizon which hides information. So there is nothing sacred about a particular solution. You should think off shell and you should think in terms of null surfaces. Second, you should also think beyond Einstein's general relativity because as we discussed in one of, the, in response to one of the questions earlier, in Einstein's theory, the entropy of the horizon comes proportional to area. And area is such a geometrical object that once you know entropy is proportional to area, you can produce 13 different ways at least of getting this result. But if you go beyond Einstein's theory, the proportionality between entropy and area breaks down and your theory should be able to reproduce that correct result if it is an underlying thermodynamic structure. This is not to say that some other theory is the correct theory and Einstein's theory is the wrong theory. It is important to expand the phase space and explore what happens because that tells you what is going on. Then there are three things, uh, two things here which comes out very uh, repeatedly in this approach. First is the relationship between nodal current and diffeomorphism and its role in thermodynamics. And the second is the role of surface terms in the action which is usually sort of given a raw deal in our discussion. Using this you can actually do something like an equipartition and uh, determine what I would call the Avogadro's number for the space time. And uh, combining this with all other ingredients, 
you can reformulate Einstein's gravity in terms of null surfaces and their deformation. Finally, somewhat more philosophically, this entire approach tells you that the quantum structure of spacetime is somewhat different in connotation compared to just quantizing gravity. The classical structure of the spacetime is described by the classical gravity. Similarly, the elastic vibrations of a, a solid is described by equations of elasticity. But if you quantize the equations of elasticity, you get phonons. You don't get the atomic structure of matter. In the same way, if you take general theory of relativity and quantize that, what you get may not be the complete picture of the underlying quantum structure of matter, a quantum structure of space time. Okay, so let us look at some of the details. So here is an event in which, around which you have a freely falling frame and a freely falling observer, and there is another observer who is stationary who has an accelerated trajectory with respect to this. And it is very well known that the vacuum fluctuations in this frame in some rigorously, uh, in a rigorous limit will appear like thermal fluctuations for this observer. And the metric which is just a flat metric as seen by this observer can be written as a hot metric with a temperature thrown in by this observer. He will measure a temperature and the metric is related to that temperature. Of course, you would have normally written it in terms of acceleration, but I would like to write it in terms of the temperature to, uh, to get this point. So essentially what we are saying is that the space time like matter can be hot and there is a temperature associated with it. And here is exactly where the connection with quantum gravity comes in because to convert the acceleration into temperature, you introduce the H cross. This temperature is completely independent of the field equation. If I have a metric without ever asking what is the field equation that metric satisfies, which theory of gravity I am looking at, I can do this and find out what the temperature associated with it. Given the temperature, there is a very natural, the temperature comes because the, there is a thermal density matrix and you can calculate an entropy associated with that density matrix called the entanglement entropy. Strictly speaking, it blows up. So you do not have a finite entropy and also it always scales as area in most of the natural cases. So if you want to think beyond Einstein's gravity and you want to look at all kinds of entropies and also you want a finite result without cutoff, this is not the right thing to do. But there is a deeper reason why this entropy does not work but temperature does work is because temperature is independent of the field equations while the entropy of a horizon actually depends on the field equation. So the entropy knows about the underlying theory, temperature does not. So in order to tell you that I need a very rapid one transparency introduction to Lovelock gravity, so which is given here, a very natural general, in case you do not know, a very natural generalization of Einstein's theory is made by making the Lagrangian dependent on a curvature tensor and metric and defining a tensor which I will call entropy tensor for reasons which will become obvious as the derivative of L with respect to R A B C D that I denote by P A B C D. Then the field equations for this theory can be written in this form which is almost like Einstein's equation where this would be R and this will be the Ricci tensor but it will have these two extra derivatives here. Now if you make an additional assumption which is a very natural assumption in physics that your equations of motion should be at most of second order then you want to look for systems in which this particular object is divergence free. Now all such tensors have been completely classified that is what uh, Lankos and Lovelock did and these theories which has a remarkable similarity to Einstein's theory are called the Lankos Lovelock models of gravity. Now the entropy of the horizon can be defined for all these theories and in fact for a much wider class of theories along the following line. You look at the diffeomorphism of the space where you go from X A to Q A. It leads to a conserved Noether current which can be expressed in this form involving this P A B C D. What you do is to compute the Noether charge com, uh, associated with this Noether current. So you do the integral of this essentially this P A B C D over the horizon surface and what you get it can be shown is a physically well defined entropy. This goes under the name Walden. So if you have a metric with a particular kind of horizon structure, the temperature is the same irrespective of from which theory that metric evolved. But the entropy of the theory depends on what is this P A B C D and with some second functional derivative of this, I can even figure out from the entropy given for the horizon what this P A B C D is. So having said that, I should emphasize that in the conventional approach where you think of gravity as fundamental, 
the connection between diffeomorphism and entropy is a mystery. I mean, diffeomorphism is like, but looking ahead, if gravity is emergent and the space time is like a solid, diffeomorphism is like pushing and pulling a solid. And obviously, you can try to connect some entropy with it. But if you don't take that emergent picture, why a conserved northern current associated with this diff diffeomorphism should have a thermodynamic meaning is not at all clear. Okay. Now, let me switch over to few other internal evidence, so to speak, which suggests that the gravity is not what it looks like and it is actually emergent. This has to do with the null surfaces. This I will skip because Rong Chen has already talked about it. It just turns out that Einstein's equations can be, uh, when evaluated near a horizon, for a very wide class of theories, reduces to a thermodynamic identity. Okay, so, this is yet another example that something interesting is happening. Now, let me come back to this concept of Navier-Stokes equation from another angle. It is not what Shiraz was talking about, but possibly could be closely related. What is not probably emphasized in uh, textbooks is that if you look at Einstein's field equation, the full nonlinear rigorous no approximation field equation, in freely falling prime, it just looks like this. It has only this many derivatives on the left hand side. What you do is go and project that onto a null surface with a metric structure given by this, which is very similar to the kind of metrics which uh, Shiraz was talking about to begin with. Then it turns out that the Einstein's equation actually becomes the Navier-Stokes equation. Okay. This is an old result in the membrane paradigm and it is obtained by projecting the equations to a horizon. What is claimed here is a generalization that it need not have any black hole horizon or any such thing. Take any space time, take Einstein's equation, project it onto a null surface, it can be rewritten in this form. I do not have time to go in detail with this. There are some very curious features which I call dissipation without dissipation. I will uh, explain to you later on if you are interested. But this is yet another example if within the context of just plain general relativity that there are two completely nonlinear systems which get mapped from one to another. Okay. The other uh, intriguing thing which we have seen recently, this is a very recent work uh, in collaboration with Bibas Mahdi, who is a postdoc at my place, is that for a very long time, Steve Carliff has been pioneering an approach where you get the black hole entropy by a particular kind of diffeomorphism of the horizon, in black hole horizons in specific. What we have seen is that this can be generalized to any null surface in any level of theory. So, it generalizes beyond gravitational theory and you do not need to have a on-shell solution with a black hole horizon. There is a very natural way of defining a, a bracket in these spaces using this Noether current and it develops a central charge and a Verossal algebra and using the usual Cardi formula, you can evaluate the entropy and lo and behold, it gives you the correct entropy. In fact, the thing I wanted to stress in all this is that these are systems in which entropies are not proportional to area. We are talking about a level of theory where the entropy in the arbitrary level of theory is a fairly complicated function and it reproduces exactly that entropy with all the prefactors through this Virasura algebra uh, idea. So, this again tells you that the diffeomorphism or distortion of null surfaces play a key role. Now, let me change tack a little bit. If all this is correct, and uh, you ha can get the dynamics as an emergent creature, should not it sort of reflect in the conventional way in which we do the dynamics. In the conventional way, we just look at the action functional for gravity, vary the action functional and we get this. In fact, it does and here the key to the whole idea is the surface terms which are there in the action, which as I said is usually not even taken into consideration. So, let me present it in a particular way. If you take the natural action principle for any level of theory again, not just Einstein gravity, it has a bulk term and a surface term and you can write it in this form. Now, suppose you take this theory, you either throw away the surface term or you cancel it by some counter terms like the Gibbons Hawking kind of extra generalized to the level of, you cancel it away, vary the remaining and you find a solution. You had already discarded this A surface, so the system is not supposed to know anything about A surface. Once you have a solution with the horizon, if you evaluate this A surface, it gives you the entropy of that horizon. So, how come the surface term knows the physics determined by the bulk term, 
when we had thrown it away before getting the field equation in the beginning. The answer to this is a very curious relationship between these two, which for want of better name, I'm borrowing a term from string theory in a completely different context. I'm calling it holography in action. What happens is the following. In all these theories, we first discovered it in Einstein gravity, then we found that in all these theories it is true. The surface term and bulk term are related by this peculiar structure. This is, uh, if you want to look at it in a simpler context, if you look at a classical mechanics problem with a L which depends on Q and Q dot, and you construct another action which is d by dt of this QP, this Lagrangian will have Q double dot, just like Einstein's gravity or Lavla gravity has. But it appears in a very particular manner in this, and it is related to the momentum space representation of path integral in uh, quantum mechanics, etc. But because of this relation, the bulk and the surface terms talk to each other. What you threw away, even though you threw it away, it knows what was the bulk which was remaining. So when you compute the integral of this L surface over a horizon, it does reproduce the uh, it does reproduce the correct uh, entropy. Okay, I think I will skip here. There is an interesting connection between the Noether current and the surface term. Let me just leave that out. Okay, so here is another example. I said that equipartition is a central idea which uh, dominated the transition from thermodynamics to statistical mechanics. So here we are in a similar situation. We are on a top structure and we are looking down and you are trying to understand what is there at the bottom layer. So is there something like equipartition which works here? In particular, Cannon asked how many degrees of freedom you need in order to hold an energy delta E at a temperature T. So you are actually asking what is the density of microscopic spacetime degrees of freedom. Can you determine that? Again, it turns out, it is not very surprising for Einstein's gravity, but it turns out that you can do this for all Lovelock theories. In any Lovelock model, the field equations in a static spacetime can be expressed in this form. The energy can be written as a energy can be written as an integral over a surface, binding surface of a local definition of temperature, where the number of degrees of freedom scales with the area. So if you have a region which has certain amount of energy and you ask how many degrees of freedom which is contributing to this when you assign a temperature due to the horizon structure, then it turns out that the number of degrees of freedom per unit area essentially is determined by exactly the same entropy tensor. And in the Einstein's theory, it is very easy. It just turns out that the number of degrees of freedom per unit area is just 1 per LP square. And the equation in that, that theory turns out to be exactly this. This is the acceleration temperature. This is dA by LP square. So it is not very surprising in this context, but the fact that you can write down the constraint equation of any Lovelock model in this form is somewhat more surprising. Okay, now if all this is true, so, so far I have been assuming the field equation or action functional or whatever of a given theory and I was using it to deduce aspects which look very thermodynamic and then I am trying to argue that look, if you stare at the structure of the theory, it tells you that it is like an emergent system and it seems to have some kind of an internal structure. Now I want to change the tag. If this is all true, can I reverse the process? Can I give a thermodynamic extremum principle from which the field equations can be derived? It turns out that you actually can. So let me explain that uh, how that works out. So you go to any event in space time, there are some null rays going through that event. Then you go to the locally inertial frame there. So the null rays now become 45 degree lines and it is valid in this local path. Now if you demand that the loss of special relativity should hold in this freely falling frame and then you say that it should hold for every in a freely falling frame at every event, you essentially end up getting the kinematics of gravity, how gravity makes matter move. You can do one step further. You look at the local Rundler observer there, which again exists in some patch, and then you write down a thermodynamic extremum principle for that. How do you do that? Again, the null surfaces and their deformation is the key. So uh, there is supposed to be this uh, famous question John Wheeler is supposed to have posed to Bekenstein uh, that whether if I throw a hot cup of tea into the horizon, what happens? Let us not throw the hot cup of tea into the horizon, but instead displace the horizon, make a virtual displacement of horizon, which can engulf some amount of matter. So we associate some thermodynamic potentials 
to normal displacements of null surfaces from the argument that the uh, the way you normally do this uh, diffeomorphism if any other surface is distorted it doesn't matter but null surfaces block certain regions from these local Rindler observers and therefore it has an entropy consideration. So this is almost like deforming a solid you in elasticity you will take a solid and you will deform it by some amount and you will associate uh, thermodynamic potentials with uh, quadratic functions of this deformation field. You can do exactly the same with null surfaces you take a null surface and you think of a distortion like this and then you associate with these null vectors which are normal to these surfaces a particular thermodynamic uh, density. You can do this you can associate a thermodynamic density with the null vectors for the deformation of the null surfaces in this form and if you demand that this should be extremum for all null vectors. The physical way of thinking about this is with each null surface you have a Rindler observer associated with that and each of the Rindler observers has a thermodynamic local thermodynamic system they are all simultaneously extremizing a free energy or entropy or what you have. And this the fact that this has to lead to the field equation uniquely fixes the form of P A B C D and it works for every uh, low log case. In particular when this deformation is of this form one can actually show that this is just the surface density of entropy as we associate using the surface terms in the action. If you do that you essentially end up getting the low log theory with an arbitrary cosmological constant. The extremum principle leads to that I will I will skip this this is just a technical point as to why derivatives of L does not appear. Further once you have got this extremum you can go back to this functional which is written down there and you can calculate it you can calculate it on the on the horizon if you have an on shell solution with the horizon and it reproduces the wall entropy this is a non trivial consistency check it was not designed to reproduce the wall entropy and it does that because of some interesting cancellation of terms etc etc so it does happen and uh, in the einstein's case this is completely equivalent to a double null version of the einstein's equation and demanding that it holds for every null vector on the space track. Okay, there are some interesting implications for cosmological constant which I will not go into. So, let me just summarize what have we got. First, I claim that this approach tells you things which you did not understand in the conventional approach. Why does, for example, the current related to a diffeomorphism of space time to have anything to do with a thermodynamic concept like entropy? Why do Einstein's equation reduce to a thermodynamic identity on all horizons? And how is it that the structure of the equation when projected to a null surface looks like a Navier Stokes equation? And why does the Einstein Hilbert action has several peculiar features and uh, the kind of holographic relation I told you, etc., etc., and a thermodynamic interpretation? And why does the surface term in the action give the horizon entropy? and the on shell action reduces essentially to the form of a free energy. And how is it that the microscopic degrees of freedom obey some kind of a thermodynamic equipartition law? And why does the thermodynamic variational principle lead to the same gravitational field equation? And finally, why does this work for a very wide class of theories much more general than Einstein's class? Now, all these questions can be phrased entirely within the context of classical general relativity and in the conventional approach the geometrical very elegant approach does not have clear physical uh, answers to any of these questions. So, while if you think of gravity as an emergent phenomena most of these questions get linked and it seems to have a nicer home in order to address questions of this kind. So, this is the first part and the second part I would like to the kind of take home message for you would be that there is sufficient internal evidence to conclude that the dynamics of the gravity is like field uh, like the equations in fluid dynamics or elasticity and the deep connection between gravity and thermodynamics goes well beyond Einstein's theory and it goes well beyond black hole horizons the entropies which are just proportional to area etc etc it is much more general and the deformations of the space time medium in general when you apply when you deform your space time and you think in this picture it does not do anything except when you start playing around with the null surface. So, when you distort the null surface you are 
tinkering with the information content which is accessible to certain observers and that is why the null surfaces and their deformation plays such a crucial role and gives you the field equation. So, the null surfaces and the null vectors provide an effective collective description in this level, but we still do not know what are the microscopic degrees of freedom from which the macroscopic thermodynamics has to come. And as I have tried to explain the gravity has this holographic features at different levels. I think I will stop with that, here are some references and uh, this is an acknowledgement to several collaborators, these three have been ex students, he is right now back in India and uh, he is with math science. Uh, Sanvet Kolekar will talk about some of these aspects in his talk later this week, I think it is on uh, Sunday, Sunday ok. And, uh, you are, uh, I, I hope you people will attend. This is two other students who are working on this, this is a postdoc with me. Ayan Mukhobadhyaya was a student at HRI who worked on this with me and Asim Paranchpai was a student at uh, TIFR at that time, he is currently in the conference. And I have benefited tremendously discussions with a somewhat unlikely person to be connected with this subject, Donald Linton Bell of Institute of Astronomy. Thank you. Yeah, Shira and uh, Spenda, ok. Cannot be accommodated at all. So, if, uh, if in a, if in some, uh, from some underlying approach we find this an echo part, then this approach has serious problems. Because people have tried to accommodate FFR by tinkering with dissipation, this, that, etc. Rongjian Kai mentioned it. I mean, there are ways of doing it, they are all dirty. I will give up, ok. So, while Lankos Lovelock models of gravity uh, comes in very, very naturally. So, certain kinds of corrections fit in, certain kinds of corrections do not. restrictions on any one you give me a correction I can tell you whether it fits in or not there is a constructive way of checking that. Yeah. Okay. Done. You need to switch it on. Okay. Uh, so, uh, what I was saying is that uh, in the morning we saw that uh, you know you start with two black right. holes they are in equilibrium in quiescent state and then you sort of evolve the system and uh, you know the the next equilibrium state is a is a another black hole right. actually ok. Now, uh, I can understand that equilibrium uh, thermodynamic uh, ideas are very nice uh, in those two initial and final state, but I think what is happening in between is very far from equilibrium actually. Yeah, I think so you have asked me this question in ATF. <laughs> so, but I did not get an answer, so yeah, perhaps. So, the answer remains the same. Just, 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 no, no, finish the question. So, yeah. so <laughs> the question is, question is then how, how do you, so Einstein's equation actually admit, uh, you know, very uh, far from equilibrium phenomena, time dependent phenomena and how can I reconcile this, all this with this thermodynamic language and thermodynamic uh, first law. I have a confusion because far from equilibrium phenomena. Uh, so yeah, let me try to remove the equilibrium in completely different context in when I talk about it and when you talk about a macroscopic phenomena like two wells, thing, black holes, etc. Normally, we associate time dependence with non-equilibrium and time independence with equilibrium. That is not the context in which this is being talked about at all. Here, for example, when I extremize a particular entropy functional for the space time. I end up getting just Einstein's equation, I am not getting a solution, I am getting the Einstein's equation, which has all its time derivatives in it, it describes n black holes coalescing with each other, because I just get back Einstein's equation or I get back Lovelock equation. So, you have to think at one deeper level. So, there is some other equilibrium which we are talking about of the microscopic atoms of space time which we do not probably understand anything, except in particular models of uh, quantum gravity and it is the equilibrium of that which exhibits in an effective field theory language at long wavelength by this phenomenon. So, it is not the normal association of time dependence is non-equilibrium, time independence is equilibrium. That idea is wrong, ok. That is not the way in which it is being talked about. Sure, but once I know what that underlying structure is, which I do not. Okay. So, the way to think about this would be to think of some kind of a vibrating null surfaces. Suppose null surfaces have fluctuations and if a null surface fluctuates by some amount, then that much of information is gone 
for a local rental observer who sees it as a horizon. So that lack of information has to appear as some kind of an entropy. These fluctuations are what we are, the entropy of associated with these fluctuations are what you are maximizing. And that gives you a handle that if it has to be simultaneously extremized for all render observers, the background geometry should satisfy a particular set of equations, which are the gravitational fields. I think I have to stop now because people will blame that I'm giving myself more questions. So we'll take it up at the question session. Yeah. To, but, but not all of it. Uh, in my uh, popular book uh, on black holes and time warps. And uh, so Patty just asked me to repeat this. So for those of you who are looking for something other than an old man's historical tales, you should go off to one of the other programs. So you, you have 10 seconds to get out of here. <laughs> OK. Uh, so let me put this in the context of uh, when I was a graduate student, I took a class from uh, Thomas Kuhn, who was a historian of science. And he uh, was just in the late stages of writing a book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution. Uh, which became later a very famous book and was tremendously influence, influential in people's thinking about the history, sociology, and the philosophy of science. In the, as uh, Tom was uh, trained as a physicist. He had a PhD in physics, so he thought about th this subject like a physicist does, which is why I felt so comfortable with what he had, had to say. He introduced the concept of a paradigm by which he meant the entire collection of research tools. You have the equations you work with, how you think about the equations uh, pictorially, uh, how you come up with uh, new ideas, how you communicate with your friends uh, in terms of pictures, diagrams, and equations uh, that, uh, in a particular area of science. So it is the uh, things that we share as a community of scientists and that we embrace when we're thinking about a particular subject. And uh, he introduced a, a description of a scientific revolution as a period when there is a major change in the paradigm that you have, not just in the equations that you're working with, but also in the pictures that go with those equations, say. And so what I'll talk about is the shifting paradigms, the revolutions, uh, with regard to black hole horizons that have occurred during my uh, long career in this field. So I begin with Roy Kerr, 1963. He discovered the Kerr metric. I remember very well his presenting this at a, the first uh, uh, Texas Symposium on Relativistic Astrophysics right after quasars were discovered. And he got up to talk, and all of the astronomers left the room because they knew this mathematics had nothing whatsoever to do with uh, the quasars they were talking about. And it turned out in the end uh, they were quite wrong. We know it did. And fairly quickly thereafter, but not immediately, it became clear that, these, that the Kerr metric describes a rotating black hole. Uh, by 1968, Roger Penrose had come to understand intuitively and mathematically uh, the storage of energy in the ergosphere of a black hole, uh, the possibility of extracting rotational energy. And so he introduced his famous Penrose pot process in which you throw in a particle and it comes very near the horizon, and at that point it splits in two pieces, and one piece goes down the horizon, and the other piece goes off to infinity, and thereby you change the mass and angular momentum of the uh, black hole, and if you do it just right, as he pointed out, you could extract energy uh, from the black hole. The energy of the outgoing particle was bigger than that of the ingoing particle because you had dropped uh, the other particle into a, quote, negative energy state you'd actually extracted some of the rotational energy of the black hole. Now, in that era, Johnny Wheeler at Princeton, who had been my thesis advisor a number of years earlier, about, about a decade earlier, he had a set of remarkable students. And among them was Demetrius Christodoulou, who has since become a very eminent mathematician uh, who works in physics to some degree. Uh, Demetrius. I uh, came to uh, Princeton as a graduate student at age about four, 15. He uh, uh, got his PhD and he celebrated his 21st birthday as a second year postdoc in my research group uh, at uh, Caltech. So he was uh, what you call a child prodigy. And he looked at the equations of the Kerr metric and the equations for the Penrose process in particular 
and realized that he could write the square of the mass of the black hole as the sum of a piece that he called the irreducible mass squared plus the angular momentum squared divided by four times the irreducible mass squared. And the significance of this was that in the Penrose process, which is the only process he looked at, that he realized if he brought the uh, infalling particle right down to just above the horizon of the black hole and then did the inje these injections in just the right way, he could evolve the angular momentum and the mass of the black hole without changing the irreducible mass. So he could take a non-spinning black hole, he could spin it up as high as he wanted, and then spin it back down through the Penrose process and re bring it back to an non-rotating black hole uh, with uh, the irreducible mass never changing. And so the irreducible mass, in some sense, was the piece not associated with uh, angular momentum. And the J squared over 4M irreducible squared was uh, a, the, uh, the uh, energy stored in the angular momentum. And, but if he didn't do it just right, he would increase the irreducible mass. And once that had happened, he could never decrease it again. So he introduced the idea of a reversible and irreversible processes, very much like in thermodynamics. And the irreversible processes uh, were the ones that increased the irreducible mass, and uh, the reversible ones were those that did not. Uh, this was uh, 1970. One year later, Stephen Hawking uh, conceived the definition of the horizon of a black hole, the event horizon, as being the boundary between those events that can and cannot send uh, signals to infinity. Uh, and he uh, simultaneously uh, devised his proof or discovered uh, the proof of the area increase law, that black hole areas can only increase, they can't decrease. And then when, uh, and I don't know whether it was he or whether it was Chris Dudulu, looked at the formula that he had for the surface area in terms of the mass and angular momentum of the black hole, lo and behold, the surface area is 16 pi times Chris Dudulu's irreducible mass squared. And so again, the fact that Hawking now had a proof that in general, no matter what kind of process you did, uh, the surface area had to increase. Chris Dudulu had had this only for uh, the Penrose process. And so it was beginning to appear that there was something truly deep going on here uh, with regard to a possible connection to thermodynamics or analogy to thermodynamics. Uh, Jacob Beckenstein, another of John Wheeler's students, and he, he, Johnny, as I, I know personally, he always encouraged his students uh, in whatever direction they had ideas. And, encouraged them to be bold, and so Jacob was very bold. He said, look, this, is, this analogy, uh, there is an analogy between area of a black hole and entropy in the sense that the two can only increase. Uh, and he argued on heuristic grounds initially that the surface area divided by the Planck mass squared should be proportional to an entropy of the black hole. And then he did a number of thought experiments to try to figure out a proportionality constant and came up with the log of 2 divided by 8 pi times surface area over Planck, uh, over pl uh, Planck length squared, that this was the black hole entropy, and claimed that there really was a true entropy there, uh, not to the, there was not merely an analogy. He had real trouble getting his paper published, uh, and uh, he wound up publishing in uh, Nuo Tremendo instead of in uh, Physical Review Letters because he couldn't get it uh, accepted by referees. Uh, just too off the wall an idea. Uh, 1972, just a matter of uh, several months after that, there was a summer school in Les Uches, uh on uh, black holes that I went to, uh, Jacob went to, Stephen Hawking went to, all, uh, most of the major players and a lot of the students who were working in the area came together for, some, for, I've forgotten, it was something like four or five weeks in the French Alps. And uh, at that meeting, uh, 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 Bardeen, Carter, and Hawking, and I have pictures of these people here, Brandon Carter, Jim Bardeen, Stephen Hawking. This is actually a photograph of Hawking that I took at that summer school. Um, so uh, the three of them got together and motivated by these analogies, formulated the four laws of black hole mechanics that look uh, just like the laws of thermodynamics, but 
Hawking was very insistent. They are not the laws of uh, thermodynamics. They cannot be, because if they were, a black hole would have to be hot. It would have to radiate, and, uh, and a black hole obviously is not hot. So this is just an interesting analogy, and it's really remarkable that you can make the analogy. Bekenstein insisted that these are laws of thermodynamics, though he also admitted that, uh, uh, that there was no way, that there was something wrong with the thing that played the role like temperature, the so-called surface gravity of the black hole. Uh, but he was still very insistent that, uh, that this was truly, the, the surface area was truly the entropy of the black hole. And so there was quite a, uh, a debate and disagreement between uh, Hawking and Bekenstein. Now I'm going to go back one year to something that was going on in Russia. Uh, and also at Maryland. In Maryland and in Russia simultaneously, to within a matter of days, uh, uh, Charlie Misner in Maryland and the Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich uh, or, uh, in uh, Moscow uh, realized that uh, you can ha have super radiance in the sense that you can send waves into a black hole and those waves will be amplified when they come out quite analogous to the Penrose process. Uh, and that's as far as it went for Charlie. But Zeldovich had tremendously deep intuition. Charlie could work this out and show that this was really true. Zeldovich couldn't work it out, but he knew it was true intuitively. And he also knew intuitively, if you can have that kind of stimulated emission of radiation, you must also have spontaneous emission, that you can send uh, a, a virtual uh, particles or the vacuum, send the vacuum in to the vicinity of the black hole uh, in an appropriate uh, wave form in the vacuum and around, and you'll get real particles off. And therefore, a black hole can uh, radiate, but it will radiate its rotational energy. No way it can radiate its uh, irreducible mass. It'll just radiate its rotational energy. This was absolutely obvious to Zeldovich and absolutely nonsense to me. And so he and I made one of my first famous bets. Uh, and, and I, he insisting black holes will radiate, and I insisting obviously they won't. Um, so then, uh, that was 71. In 72, later in, the, uh, in 1972, uh, I took Stephen Hawking to Moscow. And uh, I, I went, took Stephen because I had spent a lot of time in Moscow, and the Russians wanted him to come, but didn't know how to deal with his physical disability and didn't even dare invite him unless I came along to, to help out. And uh, so Stephen had discussions with Zeldovich. Stephen was unaware of Zeldovich's idea. Stephen had discussions of this process, and this uh, got his mind thinking about black hole radiation. He went home, and within a matter of weeks, he uh, realized that all black holes radiate, will radiate, and you can even radiate away the irreducible mass. And so he published his famous paper on this, and simultaneously then it became clear to him that Bekenstein had been right and he, Stephen, had been wrong, and that uh, uh, the laws of black hole mechanics really are the laws of thermodynamics in disguise, uh, and he got out the correct formula for the entropy, a factor of one-fourth instead of log of uh, 2 divided by 8 pi, uh, got out the right formula for the entropy, uh, inferred from the formula he computed for the temperature and from uh, the first law of, of thermodynamics. Um, now, I have to emphasize, this was work that was done at a period when no, there was no agreement on how you do quantum field theory in curved space time. Zeldovich had his way of doing it. Hawking had his own way of doing it. Bill Unruh had his own way of doing it. Uh, uh, Davies had his way of doing it, and so forth. And uh, by Zeldovich's way of doing it, he could not get to Hawking uh, radiation out. And uh, Paul Davies, similarly, initially, he could not get it out. They were sure he was wrong. And there was great debate about this as people struggled uh, over uh, how do you really do quantum field theory in curved space time? And uh, so it was 19, uh, over the period 74 to 76, there was debate. It was 1976 that I went back to Moscow and I showed uh, Zeldovich uh, several different derivations 
that, pay, that friends of mine had come up with. I'm not, not playing any role here except I'm just a, a bystander uh, listening to these debates. I showed him a particular derivation that uh, Jim Hartle uh, had come up with and other derivations. And Zeldovich and Starobinsky went back to the drawing boards. And the day I left Moscow, they called me to Zeldovich's flat. Uh, they threw up their hand like this and they said, we give up. <laughs> Hawking was right. Uh, and that was, they were the last holdouts in this process. And so we had a major paradigm shift. It had been obvious to everybody uh, that, uh, you follow, that uh, black holes cannot radiate. Now it was clear that black holes can radiate because of quantum field theory processes. And so a black hole is not the simple kind of an object that we had really understood initially, a shift in our understanding of what's going on. Uh, in order to really uh, hammer that shift home and begin to build physical intuition about it, there was a key step by Paul Davies and Bill Unruh uh, of recognizing in the calculation that in flat space time, if you have an accelerated uh, deep particle detector, that a particle detector will uh, see thermal radiation. And that this is just the uh, flat space quantum electrodynamical uh, or field theory vacuum seen in an accelerated reference frame. Uh, but Unruh took it a little bit farther and said, therefore, if you're hovering above a black hole, you will see a thermal atmosphere. If you're falling in, you won't see a thermal atmosphere, but if you're hovering above a black hole, you will. And so we now had a real big shift in our picture about black holes. They have thermal atmospheres, but you only see the thermal atmosphere if you try to prevent yourself from falling in. Um, this became even more clear in 1982 uh, when, uh, in a debate with Bekenstein over whether or not there is a limit on the entropy uh, to mass ratio for uh, objects. Uh, a piece, as a piece of that debate, Bob Wald and Bill Unruh uh, went in and did calculations of thought experiments and showed that uh, this at thermal atmosphere is really, truly very real in the sense that if you went down on a uh, rope and hung above the thermal atmosphere and scooped into a box uh, some of that uh, black hole radiation that's sitting there in a thermal atmosphere, and then uh, lifted it back up and did this over and over again, you could make the black hole lose its mass just about as fast as you wanted, that it didn't have to do it in this very, very slow way. Because the atmosphere is so rich with quanta that are flying up and then falling back in and are not escaping because they have too much angular momentum to escape. Uh, they're trapped inside there. That you could actually mine the black hole in that way. And also that you could come down here and uh, uh, put an, set an object uh, at rest in the atmosphere and it would float just to, due to buoyancy. So this atmosphere is truly, truly a uh, physical atmosphere. Even though if you fell in, you wouldn't see it. But it was still a, a truly physical atmosphere. Uh, you, you, I mean, you just can't imagine the, 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 the mind-boggling shift in, in how you think about, about the surface of a black hole that is, that is going on here in, in this process. Uh, 1976 to 87 was the development of the so-called membrane paradigm on black for black holes. Uh, the key initial steps were Roger Blanford, who I show up here uh, on the upper right, and Roman Znayek, his student for whom I don't, couldn't find any photographs. Uh, uh, in which they uh, realized that you could extract rotational energy from a black hole by depositing a magnetic field onto the black hole, holding the magnetic field on with a highly conducting, uh, electrically conducting accretion disk around the black hole that the field can't uh, get out through. And then uh, that field uh, will get plasma on it through either pair production or other processes. Uh, and uh, in that plasma, you'll have electrical current go up field lines that are winding around and around. Uh, and uh, that electrical current will uh, then deposit energy in a load out here, an atmospheric load to drive jets. Uh, and uh, so there was something really, in, and, and this would be a, a really practical way of extracting uh, angular momentum uh, and uh, rotational energy from a black hole. Uh, the key insight that they had as part of this was that the black hole is going to behave as though it had a thermal conductivity of uh, 377 ohms uh, 
per square, as, as they say, in a surface conductivity, 377 ohms of uh, electrical conduct uh, of re electrical resist resistivity in the horizon. And uh, but this was just it would behave as though it had this electrical resistivity. Thibault D'Amour came in and uh, motivated by that worked out the boundary conditions that you would have at a black hole horizon in an idealized picture, which obviously has nothing whatsoever to do with the real world, in which you assume that inside the black hole uh, there are no electric currents whatsoever, there are no electromagnetic fields whatsoever. So the black hole is terminating all electromagnetic fields. It's terminating all electromagnetic fields electrical charge or travel back out somewhere else. Uh, and so this is, a, in some sense, you ask yourself, if I want to ignore what really goes on inside a black hole, I want to build boundary conditions at the horizon of a black hole uh, for external physics. as idealized boundary conditions, as I say once again, unrelated to any, what really goes on in reality. The black hole that I annihilate uh, the uh, stress energy tensor that flows into the black hole horizon. So there's no stress energy beyond, below it. It's absolute vacuum below it. And I introduce junction conditions then at the horizon. That, uh, and you ask yourself what kinds of junction conditions you need at the horizon in order to uh, uh, put on boundary conditions for discussing external physics. And those junction conditions turned out to be that the horizon is a viscous fluid with a uh, shear viscosity and a negative bulk viscosity and an energy density, and it obeys Navier, the Navier-Stokes equation. Um, Thiebaud formulated this all in uh, covariant uh, four-dimensional space-time. And my only role, together with uh, Richard Price and Doug McDonald, for whom I don't have a, a picture, was to say, look, I want to understand this in physical terms. I've always been more of an engineer than a physicist, and I like to understand things in simple physical terms. So I said, let me make a three plus one split of space time into space plus time and turn this into simple physical pictures uh, of the sort that I've been drawing here. Uh, and in the process, in order to make things hang together, I will stretch the horizon so it's a little bit larger than the true horizon. It becomes a time-like surface and I can then think about everything in simple terms without having any kind of infinities or any null surface at the horizon. It just simplifies things. And so this led to a, a, this so-called stretched horizon where these boundary conditions are imposed. And this was in the late 1980s. Um, shortly thereafter, Lenny Susskind uh, at Stanford uh, got interested in this membrane paradigm because he was really interested in the issue of, of of uh, the entropy of a black hole. Uh, and uh, you have the problem, as a number of us, it was obvious to a number of us immediately after uh, the ideas of, uh, of Bill Ohner about a black hole atmosphere uh, came in. You would like to add up the total entropy in this thermal radiation, uh, radiation of a black hole atmosphere. And if you do, and you integrate down to the horizon, you get an infinite entropy, you get the wrong answer. And uh, so Lenny said, well, I want to take this stretched horizon seriously. And it really lives there about one Planck length above the true horizon. And if I put it at just the right location, and then I add up all the entropy in that atmosphere, I get the, the hawking Bekenstein entropy. So I get the right answer. And so Lenny then said, uh, there must be some real physics going on with this uh, black hole horizon. Uh, that these uh, that must have degrees of freedom, a huge number of degrees of freedom in this black hole horizon, this stretched horizon, uh, that are related to uh, the uh, to producing the Hawking radiation and related to issues in the loss of information. When uh, we think of information being lost, it must be in some sense be stored in this stretched horizon that uh, uh, lives slightly above the true horizon. I have to say that I, as an engineer. Uh, I found this totally implausible. I never took it very seriously. Uh, but uh, it, it was one of the major motivating factors for Lenny Susskind to introduce, one of the people who introduced the ideas of holography that are so, uh, so well established now uh, among string theorists and, and particle theorists. And very recently, Andrew Strominger at Harvard and his colleagues 
uh, have returned to this and uh, are using these stretch horizon ideas and uh, this, this uh, uh, fluid analogy for the horizon that comes out of the membrane paradigm uh, in uh, lending clarity to ideas about ADS, CFT. So these ideas continue to live among people who really believe, as I do not, that there is something fundamentally going on here in terms of the degrees of freedom of the stretch to arise, something very, very deep. And I, as a simple engineer, as far as I'm concerned, this is nothing except to the, uh, the boundary conditions that we put on the external universe if we want to pretend there's nothing uh, going on inside there. And so, and so I suppose I will maybe be proved wrong, but I'm one of the last to accept the newest of the paradigms, is that these, the sequence of paradigm shifts has occurred over these years. There, there's my history. <laughs> Stephen and I are on one side, and, uh, and uh, Preskill is on the other. And Stephen has conceded, and I've not conceded yet. And it's not because I have any deep in, insights. It's because I will concede. The very fact that I don't understand these issues means that I decided I will concede once all of the re people I respect in this area concede. And there are holdouts like UNRWA and WALD, and uh, so I'm just waiting for, for them. But, so, but, but I have no bet with Lenny or with Andy. I just want to advertise it. You can, you can add one line to this um, yes. applications of the membrane paradigm. It, it's not me. It's some work from some uh, young postdoc, Eugenio Bianchi, who has used the membrane paradigm. In fact, this connects to the latest discussion for this. Um, there have been in, in loop quantum gravity a long discussion of black hole entropy and a long work for, for computing black hole entropy, and there's a big literature on that. What Eugenio Bianchi did is just to say, forget all that, and let's go back to the membrane paradigm and take it seriously as if uh, I could reproduce, as you're saying, the boundary conditions of some actual surface there, and look at the degrees of freedom of this surface as, as, as something that could shake and treat this with the kinematics of, of, uh, of, the, of the quantum theory. And he has reproduced entirely precisely the spectrum of the excitations from the quantum theory and uh, the black hole counting. Uh, so I think this is a next application of the idea of the, of the member paradigm that works very well. But it also a little bit, I mean, I, I, I share with you the point of view that there's nothing else, that is natural space time there, is nothing else, the boundary condition. But it strengthens even more that we can, we do can, we, we do have the possibility of thinking of it as, as, as some actual yeah. thing whose degrees of freedom are relevant. Yeah. Prizes come along in theoretical <coughs> physics that I'm, uh, ready to admit there may be something very deep going on here, just that I don't see it. You mentioned this uh, result that uh, even though black holes radiate, if you are freely falling, you don't detect that. Now, any other motion other than free fall and at any distance uh, would see some radiation. So there is some this one special motion which... Uh, so does this imply that uh, if I have thermal radiation from some other source, from a hot surface, and if I have some kind of a special motion, I can, I can have a situation where I don't detect it. I don't know. Because no. it's very puzzling to me. No. I mean, no. what you I said. I don't know. Okay. Uh, by the way, you're looking at a picture of a causal set here, which is what my um, talk on Sunday will be about. But it will also figure somewhat in this talk as, back, as motivation and background. So what I want to do mainly is show you a new kind of formula that assigns an entropy to an arbitrary region of space of a causal set or equally an arbitrary region of a space-time. With an appropriate choice of the region, it will yield the entanglement entropy of a black hole, which we've heard about before. But in the end, it can be derived without reference to either black holes or causal sets, although it came up in connection with the problem of how to compute the entropy, the entanglement entropy of a scalar field in a causal set. In the context of causal sets, um, the entanglement entropy across the black hole horizon of a scalar field living in the causal set. So for that reason, let me begin by describing some of that background and context 
it would have been a little better if this talk had come after the other talk, which introduces causal sets. So I hope it won't be too obscure when I refer to some of their properties. And I'll try to get quickly, relatively quickly, to the main formula. Um, so as we've heard several times today, black hole entropy seems to be an important clue to quantum gravity. Uh, and one of the con main contributions to the black hole entropy is what's called the entanglement entropy, which is which we've also heard, I think, a little bit referred to, and it'd be familiar to many of you. Uh, if we compute this entanglement entropy in the continuum, however, we get an infinite answer. In order to get rid of this infinite answer, we can introduce a cutoff, and if we do that, we obtain, instead of an infinite answer, we obtain an area low. We obtain the entanglement entropy uh, equal to the area of the black hole in units of the cutoff. That, of course, compares favorably with the formula that we saw before, which is the area, which I've written in a slightly unfamiliar way, perhaps, as the Bekenstein Hawking uh, entropy of a black hole is 2 pi times the area in the kind of cosmologist units in which 8 pi g is equal to 1, rather than the units in which g equals 1. And the, the 2 pi actually has, as it turns out, if you go through the derivation, the geometric meaning. It's just the circumference of a circle. However, um, this contribu no, I mean, I should mention, this contribution is not universal in the sense that people use it and say that critical exponents are universal. In fact, it depends on the details of the cutoff, and in particular, it depends on the magnitude of the cutoff, which, in fact, makes it more interesting than universal uh, quantities. That if we, universal quantities are interesting if you don't want to know about the microscopic details, but if what you're really interested in is the microscopic details, which in this case we are in quantum gravity, they're in some sense the most universal. And so we'd like to understand this contribution of the entanglement entropy. However, when we try to compute it, it's not only uh, depends on the magnitude of the cutoff, it depends on the details of how it's introduced and it depends in a, in a non-covariant way. So I just uh, briefly ask a bunch of questions to illustrate this. So for example, when we put a cutoff in a Schwarzschild black hole, should we put it at a certain radius distance from the horizon? If so, what coordinate system should we measure the radius in? Is it the radial coordinate that gives the area of the spheres? Is it proper distance along a hypersurface? If it is, which hypersurface should we use? All of those will affect the answer. Here's, well, yeah, here's a picture. I don't know. Here's a picture of the black hole space time. Um, yeah. this, I've shown it as a, an internal Schwarzschild black hole using the usual Penrose diagram. And this is a hypersurface that, if I extended it across the full space time from, pl from the infinity of one asymptotic region to infinity of the other asymptotic region, it would be a Cauchy surface and there would be, say, no entropy on it because we're in a pure state. But if I cut, if I stop the surface here, which is what an external uh, agent could have access to, then, of course, there's an entanglement entropy, as is well known. The re effective reduced density matrix for this hypersurface, I'm thinking in the continuum now, is not a pure state, and there's an entropy associated. So that, that's the entanglement entropy that I'm talking about. So, however, to give it a precise meaning and to answer, to even begin to address the kind of question that Patty was raising about how would it look in a different kind of theory of gravity, would it, certainly you might get a slightly a different answer. There would be subleading terms, not exactly the area. We have to have a particular microscopic model of space-time. So, the model I'm uh, that I'm working have in mind in all of this is the causal set. Causal sets don't need a cutoff. They are, they are fundamentally discrete. But from a phenomenological point of view, they do offer a kind of covariant cutoff. Now, to what extent can we repeat those words that I just said about the entanglement entropy in the case of a causal set? So just to review, not to read every sentence here, the notion of horizon, the notion of black holes, those are very meaningful directly in the causal set because the notion of causal, relate, uh, because the horizon is essentially defined in a causal way. 
if we use the event horizon, not necessarily the, some of the other horizons people were talking about today, but if we use the event horizon, it's defined in a causal way. And so the notion of black hole is well defined, the notion of horizon in, is effectively well defined. Even the notion of hypersurface can be given a clear meaning in the causal set. But the notion of, the notion of um, density matrix on a hypersurface is not well defined for a causal set. Essentially, there's not enough structure on a set of causally unrelated elements, which is what a, hyper, a space like hypersurface is, in order to give uh, notions like in order to give notions like initial data a meaning there. So I've made some comments here that uh, about even in, if you're thinking in terms of quantum gravity notions, the notions you're used to in uh, canonical quantum gravity like extrinsic curvature, induced metric, none of those really make sense. And it's a reason that I've never felt, one of the reasons I've never felt that canonical quantization is in the end a viable route to, to, canono, to quantum gravity. But uh, if we want to discuss entanglement entropy, we, if we have a good theory of quantum gravity, we should be able to discuss entanglement entropy somehow. So the question becomes, can we free the notion of entanglement entropy from reference to a density matrix defined on a hypersurface? That's the sort of the question that led to the formula I'm going to present to you. And I, let's consider that question in the simplest case which is that of a free scalar field. So for a moment, I'm still thinking in the continuum. So we have a quantum field theory for the scalar field phi uh, that's very familiar. And in fact, we have a causal set version of that as well, which I'll talk about briefly on Sunday. But as I said, what we don't have is the notion of state on a hypersurface. And of course, maybe I should also emphasize one other thing that in this goes back to this picture. This hypersur the we're used to thinking that the entropy is the area, but that's an equilibrium statement. We also heard earlier how when in a dynamical situation where the area is changing, of course the entropy is changing. So it's important to be able to take this surface sigma, this hypersurface sigma, to move around and to get different answers for the entropy for different choices of sigma. So the entropy is inherent, the entropy that's a physical interest is inherently dependent on the choice of hypersurface. So the, the challenge then is can we, can we in some way uh, translate this definition that is usually used for the entropy into a space time language that's suitable for the causal set? doesn't refer directly to a hypersurface. So to do that, let me re recall, let me briefly recall the algebraic definition of entropy. So if we think in a rather abstract way, we, I said we had this quantum field theory on the space-time. You know, if we think, if we abstract away from the particular field equations and so on, what we have is an algebra of operators, phi of x, which generate a, uh, we have a, a set of operators, phi of x, which generate an algebra, which I've called here A. This algebra is represented irreducibly in some Hilbert space. And the global state is represented by some density operator rho, which gives expectation values in the usual way. Once we have all those things, we've represented the expectation value functional as a, um, terms of a density matrix or density operator, then we have the usual definition of entropy, which is trace rho log rho inverse. Now, this is giving us a global entropy for a global state. If we, if, however, I just emphasize that we want to define entropy on a hypersurface. So given a surface sigma, as in that picture, we can go through, we can mimic what we just did globally, but with a subalgebra. So instead of having access to all the field operators in the whole space time, we have access now only to the field operators on that uh, surface outside, that portion outside the horizon. We choose to have access only to those. 
then they generate not the whole algebra of operators, but some subalgebra of the algebra of operators, which I've called here A of sigma, which is a proper subalgebra. And in fact, it's generated by the initial data phi and phi dot on sigma, again in the continuum. Well, we can take expectation values of that. Uh, we can restrict the expectation value uh, functional to that subalgebra. That gives us, if we irreducibly represent that subalgebra, that gives us a density matrix in some, Hil some other Hilbert space, H of sigma, which is uh, associated with that, that, por that partial Cauchy surface, sigma. Once we have the density matrix in that other Hilbert space, we can form its entropy in the usual way. Now, when the theory, when the theory we're dealing with is a unitary theory, which it is in the case of the ordinary quantum field theories in curved space-time, I guess Kip said that there was at some point a confusion over it, but I think there's general agreement now what a quantum field theory in curved space-time, certainly for a free field, would look like. When we do that, and when sigma, the hypersurface that we're interested in, the entropy of, when we take that sigma to be the whole, to be a Cauchy surface for the whole space-time, then the algebra that it generates is the whole algebra. And that means we're dealing with a global state. This suggests that if we can do the same, so that we can translate this local condition on the hypersurface into a global one, or this local, local question on the hypersurface into a global one. That suggests that if we work with a partial surface, sigma, partial Cauchy surface, we should be able to translate the question about the entropy on it into a global question as well. And indeed we can. So let me show you first how we would translate the question about the entanglement entropy on sigma into a, glo a question about a global state. So here we have, we have, um, here we have the hypersurface sigma again, here's the horizon. We're interested in the initial, in the algebra generated by phi and phi dot on the surface. But that algebra is the same as the algebra of all the operators in this region R, which is the region to the future of that surface, but outside the horizon. The reason being that this is what's called the domain of dependence of that surface. So anything, any field operator in this region can be rewritten algebraically using the equations of motion in terms of the operators on sigma. And of course, vice versa, if you know all the operators in, ro in R, you certainly know the operators in sigma. So I really have to ask about the subalgebra of a space-time region. That's the key step. Once I do that, that makes sense in the causal set. That, that was the point of the motivation. Um, that's, that's why the causal set question motivated this. I'm just repeating what I said. The moral of this so far is that entanglement entropy, although we normally associate it with the horizon, it can be thought of as a special case of the entropy of an arbitrary space-time region. So our, we've now reformulated a problem. How do we compute the entropy of an arbitrary space-time region? The rest of the talk is the answer to that question. It, it turns out there's a remarkably simple formula in terms of what's called the Whiteman function that'll give you this entropy of any region. There's a small caveat here. I think it's pretty small at this point, but this is still somewhat of a work of progress work in progress and a few loose ends still remain. So let me, let me restate now where we are and what we need to do. We have an algebra A, an expectation value functional on that algebra. What we want to do is represent it in some Hilbert space H and to find a density matrix in that Hilbert space which reproduces the expectation value functional and then compute the entropy of that density matrix. At this point, I'm switching notation from phi of x, which is a kind of, um, kind of uh, a continuum kind of notation, into a, a index notation phi j, which is easier to work, make the discussion a little clearer, the formulas look a little clearer. And of course, for the causal set, it's more literally correct, because we have only a finite number of elements, and we have a value, a field operator for each element. 
the one big assumption that I have to make now is that the field is not only free, but that the state is Gaussian, or what you might call Wickian, in the sense that Wick's rule holds. Wick's rule is this um, thing that allows you to convert you know, an expectation value of any product of field operators into expectation values of pairs. In other words, it allows you to rewrite, this is very familiar, I think, to people, it allows you to rewrite the expectation value of any polynomial in the field operators in terms of what's called the Whiteman function, W, J, K, as I've written it here, which is just the expectation value of uh, this product of pairs. Here I've given an example um, of how that, how you can use the Wick, how you can use Wick's rule, but let me, since I think maybe I'm getting a little late, let me just skip that and go on to the rest of the calculation. So, so remember, we have this field operators phi. They're generating an algebra. We, have, we know the expectation value of any pair, product pair, this w, j, k. We need, what we need to do is to represent the whole algebra and, find, and most importantly, find the density matrix that, rep, that reproduces that expectation value. So since the field is non-interacting, it's generated, it's generated in a rather simple way by the field operators phi sub j. The only relations are, in fact, the equations of motion, which are linear relations, and the can canonical commutation relations which are bilinear. Using a little bit of algebra, it's matrix theory, you can show that I can that in this situation there will exist a basis that is a set of linear combinations of the phi's, which I've called Q alpha and P alpha, which obey the usual canonical commutation relations. Now I should stress that this I'm not these are not actually the Q's and P's of any harmonic oscillator or anything like this. They're just linear combinations of the field operators, the space-time field operators that obey the canonical commutation relation in the familiar way. <coughs> okay, by construction, this basis, these Q's and P's diagonalize the skew symmetric part of W, because what is W itself was um, the expectation value of the product of phi j and phi k. But since we're dealing with a free field, well, so if we take the imaginary part of that, that's the same as taking the anti-symmetric part. But since it's a free field, that's just the commutator, and that's just a C number. So we already know, independently of one, whatever, whatever the physical state might be, we know the expectation value of the anti-symmetric part of the Whiteman function. I mean, we know the expectation value of the anti-symmetric product of the fields, which is the anti-symmetric part of the Whiteman function. But what's less obvious, and that can be diagonalized by these choice of Q's and P's, what's less obvious, but is also true, is that you can choose the Q's and you can choose these particular linear combinations of the field operators to diagonalize the symmetric part, what you might call the fluctuation of the scalar field, that is the symmetric part, uh, the real part of W. So once we've done that, we've diagonalized both the symmetric and the anti-symmetric part of W since we've diagonalized W itself, so Whiteman function. That, in turn, splits the problem up into a prob product of individual problems, each one for a single pair of Q and P, what you might call a single degree of freedom. So our problem is now reduced to finding the entropy for a conjugate pair, QP, in a Gaussian state. And once we solve that, then we'll go back and rewrite the answer in terms of the full field set of field operators. Okay, so what did we have? We had the Whiteman function. In this case, we have only two field operators, um, for a whole set of field operators, phi j, phi 1, phi 2, up to phi n, which in the continuum is an infinite set. Now we're down to 2, and we have, remember the Whiteman function 
was the expectation value of phi j phi k, we cut ourselves down to one quote unquote degree of freedom. So all we have non-trivially is the expectation value of this, the expectation value of phi 1 squared, and, so, and the expectation value of phi 2 squared. But I remember I had renamed these as q and p uh, because I chose the right linear combinations to um, make them look as if they were q and p. So when I say I had the Whiteman function, what I have now is really the expectation value of q squared p squared and the real part of qp. The imaginary part is trivially uh, just the unit operator times the imaginary unit i. So the problem is, given a Gaussian density matrix, as I've written here, to find the entropy from these correlators. So, um, so we have these three correlators. We have here the most general Gaussian density matrix. You can see that there are three, three parameters here, real parameters a, b, and c, to match the three things three components of the Whiteman function that we have here. So this is just a, now a, a technical question. What is the entropy of this density matrix in terms of A, B, and C? If we use the fact that some things we know about entropy, like it's dimensionless, it's invariant under unitary transformations, then we can convince ourselves that, in fact, the S, although it a priori depends on these three numbers, it only depends on a particular combination, and therefore on these three correlators. It depends only on a particular correlation, combination of the correlators, which is this q squared, p squared minus real q p squared, which is actually um, just the determinant of this matrix, this, this Whiteman function regarded as a matrix. It also can be written as the determinant, that same combination is the determinant of the real part, that's R is, remember, the real part of the Whiteman function, divided by the determinant of the imaginary part, which is just this 0, 1, minus 1, 0, because of the commu canonical commutation relations. So it turns out <coughs> that when, when you just work out what this combination is, just do the Gaussian integrals, that that B drops out. It only depends on the third component, uh, on the third term and the first term, the ratio C over A. So if we want to compute it, we can set B equals zero. So anyway, it's just a computation. And we find the value of the entropy to be, um, although I say it's just a computation, I don't know a really simple way to do it. But anyway, <laughs> you can do it. And you get this value that I've written here. It's, it's, it's becoming quite a simple expression. It's just mu log mu plus 1 minus mu log 1 minus u over 1 minus mu, where mu is uh, this particular combination, algebraic function of that ratio c over a. So we're almost done. If we put all the pieces together, that is, go back and re-express everything in terms of the uh, Whiteman function itself, the, com the correlators of q and p, then we can rewrite the answer a slightly different way, in terms, as you see here, in terms of sigma plus a half log of sigma and so on, minus sigma. Where the important thing is sigma is now the eigenvalues, what I've called here the spectrum. Sigma is the two, the two values of sigma, I mean, plus or minus i sigma are the two eigenvalues of this matrix, which is the real part of the Whiteman function times the inverse of the imaginary part of the Whiteman function. So this is already quite simple. But we can make it a little bit simpler by instead of working with the eigenvalues of the real part of the Whiteman function, we work with the full Whiteman function. So instead of forming the real part of the Whiteman function times the inverse of the imaginary part, if we just form the inverse of the imaginary part times the full Whiteman function, um, we get a slightly simpler and, and we could, we look at its eigenvalues, we get something slightly simpler. I remind you that the full Whiteman function is just its real part plus i over 2 times its imaginary, times this uh, commutator function. So let's call the spectrum 
of d this W delta inverse, let's call the spectrum plus or minus I times omega plus or minus, which if you translate it into the other t notation is I times one half plus or minus sigma. It turns out that the un a version of the uncertainty principle implies that this omega plus and omega minus are both positive numbers. In fact, it's the nicest way of deriving the uncertainty principle. And so you get this very simple expression for S, omega plus log omega plus minus omega log omega minus. This was all one degree of freedom. Now let's return to the, um, let's return to the full field theory, either on a causal set or in the, I think is a very interesting question. But the, what I, the derivation I showed you only goes through under those assumptions that you refer to. So, so I'm not talking in the co so in the causal set context. Your real question, I think, it goes to another question, which is how do we set up a scalar field theory or quantum field theory and the causal set it out at all? And I think what you're what you're saying makes a lot of sense. Which it, it, you can't do it by starting with equations of motion. It doesn't work. The the, the number of a, the in the continuum, the equations of motion are very restrictive, and they you know, can they reduce everything to just data on a surface? In the causal set, the strictly true equations of motion are very few. And what replaces the others is sort of approximate equations of motion. You need to sort of follow a slightly different tack in order to set up the scalar field theory. I'll briefly say something about it on my talk on Sunday. You, you, you spoke about holography in the context of you know, calculating the full space-time action and having that be related to the entropy of a horizon. Right. I'm wondering if one can understand that from a Euclidean standpoint, mm -hmm. because the Euclidean space-time has usual cigar, yeah. and you can uh, right. analyze it as Hawking did by breaking the action up into a small neighborhood of the horizon and, right. and the rest. Is it that works for Gia. Okay. But when we tried it out for uh, Lovelock gravities, it is not so easy. Uh, because the Euclidean extension of these theories is, has tricky issues involved with that. In GR it is fine, and in GR it is, uh, the, the concept that action is essentially the free energy, etc., etc., was given and Hawking, it was already known. But the new stuff which I was stressing was that the entire formalism goes through for Lovelock theories, and that was the main message in throughout the talk, because everything which I have said is not, is context free, and it is for uh, all Lovelock theories. And there also there is a bulk term and a surface term. And it is related by that peculiar relation which is d by dt of pq. Okay. And, uh, so that is the new stuff, which I don't know how to understand. Right? Thank you. Boom. Okay, all right. Philosophy behind uh, your work is that you will use the same metric theory, but the dynamics of yes. what governs the evolution equation of the metric you uh, derive from thermodynamic consideration. Now, the question is that thermodynamic consideration already links the horizon entropy, which in the standard scenario has come from quantum field theory in curved space time. So, basis of entropy has come from quantum theory, and using that, you are getting a classical evolution of the metric, namely the Einstein equation, from this consideration. So, at the same time, this theory would say that the metric should not be quantized because it's an effective thermodynamic state. So here you have a dichotomy that you have used the quantum theory to get at the Einstein equation. Having obtained that in this paradigm, the Einstein's general relativity must not be quantized because it is essentially a thermodynamic equation of state. Okay, two, I can answer it at different levels. Uh, it is correct that mathematically when you talk about emergent gravity, you can ask what is emergent. I mean, there are the full quantum gravity people who is doing this. 
could probably climb that even the entire space time everything has to come out as emergent and the metric is some kind of a collective variable etc etc i don't have the tools to do any of this and i am doing from top down so i start with a space time which has a metric and just as you said the metric is a background variable for me then there is some other principle whose extremization puts a constraint on this background and you can show this all works out mathematically etc etc <coughs> now the broader question is what does this mean does it mean metric should be quantized or not i would have said you shouldn't and uh, my picture is that the metric in some sense is like the density and velocity fields which you will use in elasticity so if you quantize them you do get something like phonons and if you quantize metric you will get gravitons but if you are looking for a deeper underlying microstructure of space time this may not be the right way to go but that is in the realm of speculation um, example of emergent space time that seems very concrete namely the adi cft correspondence right. in that context we can ask whether or not it's correct to quantize the metric well um there may be many ways of doing this but one way that certainly correct is to quantize the so the, so uh, the, the uh, in the holographic description the things that you should quantize at least one way of doing it correctly is to quantize the gauge fields which are the n cross n matrices the gravitons on the other hand are trace operators that you form out built out of these gauge things and that's not how one normally does gauge theory one doesn't normally quantize these trace operators so i think at least in the einstein's equations follow without anything but a pure geometry just generalization of minkowski geometry and then you don't have to talk about gravitation or anything the first just the geometry gives the equations and then we interpret these equations as applying to space time structure and the motion of the matter and so on and so forth now so in this approach what happens how do you get the geometry underlying geometry this way or you forget the whole geometry and you just take uh, these einstein's equations as given and try to interpret them and in, uh, from point of view of no. at least in my approach i think of einstein's equations as given but i do think of some space time manifold and a metric and the structures on that and etc as given so the question ultimately this is this is just a first step and ultimately you have to replace all these with some pre geometric structure and we heard from rafael one possible way it could be cosets it could be loops of the loop quantum gravity it could be the strings it could be any of these things okay but i keep an open mind but uh, all these people would claim that that is where you should start from and then the metric will emerge as this thing. and i'm hoping that this top down approach will pay some dividends which can match with the bottom up approach but the whole uh, structure of einstein's equations depend on a differential manifold and that all reductions that doesn't create any problem that all works through smoothly mathematically i just i can i don't disagree i can completely agree with what he said and what you said in response to but i think kamish's comment points up a very important uh requirement that any emergent gravity theory if you want to use that word must satisfy and that is that it must reproduce the continuum with its geometrical structures and its diffeomorphism its smoothness and there's a tremendous amount of mathematical structure buried in our simple idea of a continuum that people have been worried about for the last 2000 years at least since people like zeno and it's not and it's not at all easy that you reproduce it. i mean if you start with something like a causal set and you pick it at random without any dynamics at all what what will it look like it look like a un- little universe that expands sort of infinitely rapidly lasts three planck times and disappears yeah, that, so <laughs> that's right so so the more radical you are in your starting point the more the onus is on you to ultimately reproduce the geomet- geometric structures that we know and love once you do that then i think Einstein's equation is more or less given to you free but it's that step uh, can i borrow a term from like anderson who said in more is different that you need not to go for a bottom up approach or a top down approach every scale it's in itself intrinsically you have to say.
but I understand that you have a negative cosmological uh, constant because you are using ADS CFT. Uh, but the way you presented it, it was like doing a perturbation theory. So I don't know exactly, I didn't understand where exactly you needed the negative cosmological con constant. Um, so the equations that I looked at were Einstein's equations with a negative cosmological constant. Now there are two questions. The first question is what role did the negative cosmological constant play in getting my results? The second question is why on earth am I considering a negative cosmological constant? Let's separate these two. Okay. The, the, for the first question, as far as I can tell, the negative cosmological constant played a, an important role. Okay. Uh, if you try to do the same thing in flat space, without putting very artificial boundary conditions, the kind Strominger and company put, for instance, uh, you know, in mid, mid, mid slices, nothing good happens. Okay. So uh, the, the ADS space um, has uh, uh, a very natural place where you put boundary conditions, namely the end of the Penrose diagram of ADS space. And uh, uh, the negative cosmological constant is important in many ways for the mathematics what I presented. Okay, so this is the question of why does it, I mean, did, did, this was the question of was the negative cosmological constant important for the mathematical identity between Einstein's equations in the wrong wavelength limit and the Navier-Stokes equations in a, um, in a derivative expansion. The answer, to my mind, I mean, uh, you can, well, to my mind is in a natural, if you want to be natural, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, now the question is, why did you, why did I, why did I study this problem in the first case? That, of course, is motivated by the ADS-CFT correspondence. So just to review, the best understood examples of the ADS-CFT correspondence assert that, uh, um, a field, a conformal field theory is dual to gravity uh, on uh, I, I, uh, gra gravitational equations, uh, which always ad ad admit a consistent truncation to Einstein's equations to a negative cosmological constant uh, in asymptotically ADS spaces. Okay? Now, it's been believed for a long time, for almost 200 years, in some form or the other, that any reasonable physical system uh, therm thermalized in appropriate thermal thermally equilibrated situations is described by, uh, by, fluid, by the equation of fluid dynamics. Quantum field theories are reasonable physical systems. So you, put the, you, you, so you conclude that under reasonable, reasonable circumstances, the boundary theory, the dual to gravity on a, on a, or a gravity with a negative cosmological, negative cosmological constant, must be under appropriate system, uh, circumstances described by fluid dynamics. However, ADS-CFT also asserts uh, a more interesting and more exact um, formulation of, the, of uh, field theory dynamics. That is, field theory dynamics under other circumstances is Einstein's equations. So you put these two statements together, then it had better be that Einstein's equations with the negative cosmological constant in asymptotically ADS space, in appropriate circumstances, reduces to Navier-Stokes equations. So ADS-CFT was the guidance. You see, as I, as, as I as tried to present in the morning, the mathematics is pretty simple. Once you know what question you should address, it's not hard to get at it. The ADS-CFT told you what the right question to ask was. Yeah, viscous term, uh, and you implied that the shear viscosity was present, and we are wondering whether one can have bulk viscosity or radiative viscosity. Is it possible? Can it fall out of that? Okay. So, um, you know, so again, let me divide this up. In the mathematical system I was uh, addressing, you do, not, you, do not, you do not have bulk viscosity. And the reason for that is simply conformal invariance. You know, uh, conformal invariance asserts that the stress tensor of the field theory you're studying, the boundary stress tensor, the boundary here, is traceless. Okay? Now, shear viscosity is a term in the stress tensor proportional to del dot u times eta, or more, more precisely, the part of eta orthogonal to the velocity. Yes. Take the trace of that. The trace of that is 3 times del dot u. Okay? So the fact that the stress tensor has to be traceless tells you that the coefficient of this term must vanish. Okay? So in my system, you do not have a bulk viscosity. However, just, just to, uh, like I try, um, you know, the, the thing I presented was just the simplest example of, of, a, of several that have been worked out. Now, you could work out the, the, the fluid dynamical dual to, for instance, the near horizon geometry of the D2 brain. Okay, this is some um, two, two plus one dimensional field theory that is not conformally invariant. 
In this case, you can have a bulk viscosity, and you do. What is photon viscosity? Photon viscosity? Actually, I would have to understand it in terms of its contribution to the stress test. Yes. Uh, right. But you see, the, the system I, I presented was so nice and simple, so exactly solvable because it preserved a lot of symmetry. But symmetry forbids some structures. Yeah, so we've heard two different uh, uh, ways of getting the Navier-Stokes equations out of general relativity, one from ADS-CFT, one from the membrane paradigm. And I, I'd like to understand, you know, in what ways they're related. They clearly look different, uh, as Shiraz stressed. Uh, yeah, one, you need certain boundary conditions, ADS uh, boundary conditions. The other one, you don't. You just well, look one it. has vanishing bulk viscosity, the other has non-zero <laughs> negative bulk viscosity. Okay. And, and the shear viscosity over entropy is not one over four pi, or that yeah, is? It is. It is. Oh, yeah. You get the you get the same shear viscosity, but a different bulk viscosity. Any insight into why? I mean, is it a coincidence? It sounds too much to be a coincidence. You can't expect any insight from an engineer. <laughs> I can make a comment on that. Uh, listen to the way Shira has approached this problem. There is a very specific way of doing the perturbation expansion on the long wavelength limit. What is done in membrane paradigm, the canonical way or the way I described it, you just take Einstein's equation, project it onto a null surface. You don't do anything else. Exactly, exactly. And it is not completely constrained equation because of the null vector nature, but broadly it is Einstein's equation which is projected. What happens is that it is remarkable that when you take Einstein's equations and you project it, it looks like Navier-Stokes equation. That I don't have a deep insight into. But if you now go and do what ads or the string theory motivated people do, in the sense of do an epsilon expansion in that, you do end up in order by order, at least very preliminary thing which I have tried out shows that you reproduce this conformally invariant stress tensor and you essentially end up getting zero bulk viscosity and the Navier-Stokes equation, the standard, uh, uh, standard shear viscosity. So which seems to suggest that the uh, negative lambda and the ADS-CFT part is not really necessary and you should be able to approach it more generally, but it is still work in progress. Uh, maybe I could add to that. Strominger and friends have uh, tried to sort of interpolate between what we did and between the membrane paradigm. Uh, and my understanding of what they did was the following. Um, uh, they, they worked in a general context, but suppose you restrict what they did to negative cosmological constant gravity, which you can. Okay? Then, um, instead of putting boundary conditions, so in what we did, we put boundary conditions at the... Uh, boundary of ADS. Those were one of the boundary conditions we put. Okay. Now, instead of doing that, you could uh, do the following. You could try to put some sort of boundary conditions um, at a mid-radial position in ADS. Okay. The kind of boundary conditions you put, could put is like gravity in a box. That your boundary, the induced metric on your boundary is what it would have been in empty ADS at radius R. Okay. That's the kind of boundary condition you could put. So now, if you take that, that boundary condition and take R to infinity, you recover what we have. But you could try to now solve this mathematical problem as a function of your boundary condition. OK. And um, if you then, what, what, what they claim is that if you then uh, uh, take this, this boundary condition towards the horizon, the R goes towards the horizon, then you recover the kind of thing that the membrane paradigm people talk about, namely ordinary non-relativistic Navier-Stokes equations. No, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I haven't seen have it. They have to reproduce that, except that they have this epsilon upon m as this small parameter, mm. right? Which is, which is, see, you know the old idea of short tail metric that is the mean creep path is not scaling as a small parameter compared to the rest of it. 
because there is only one scaling parameter yes. m in it. And ADS CFT, you guys solved that problem because you had to scale. So in Strominger's approach, as I understand it, he put the stress horizon at a distance epsilon, and epsilon by m gives him an extra small parameter. Yes. So then. Uh, but, but just one more comment about that. You know, um, actually in follow-up to our original paper, uh, we had solved the most general, for, solved for the most general slowly bearing metric in ADS space, including the possibility that the, uh, your boundary conditions at infinity were not ADS, but asymptotically locally ADS with an arbitrary boundary metric. And since this is the most general slowly bearing metric, which now depends on 10 plus 4 parameters, because the boundary metric plus the velocities. Everything that Strominger and company do, do in this context is a special case of our solution. Okay, so now you can ask, what are they doing in, in our language? And what they're doing is really funny. From the point of view of the boundary field theory, they are scaling the boundary metric as a function of the velocity flow. Okay, in such a way that you, 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 you actually approach the non-relativistic limit of the neighbor sticks. I could tell you more about that later. Yeah, unfortunately, we have time for just one more question. If you allow me, sorry, if there's one second. Uh, it's just an advertisement. I, I, I'm giving a talk which should have been in this uh, uh, section, so I wanted to let everybody know. And it has a wrong title on the program because um, Originally, I was asked to talk about loop quantum gravity, and so the title is still loop, loop quantum gravity, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about something which is strictly related to everything we've been discussing here, so uh, UNU temperature, and I'll dispute the claim that the UNU temperature is uh, um, related to entropy entanglement, to the entanglement entropy. So this will be Sunday at 3 in the quantum gravity section, and it will be about uh, the UNU temperature. Thank you. Okay.